Hey hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. This is, <laughs> I want this to be a bit of a fun video. I don't know how well it's going to go over. I hope you guys enjoy it. It's not to be taken too seriously, but uh, I thought what we'd look at is what is my list for the top five armies of the Napoleonic period. Now I'm going to talk about this historically, not necessarily in the game. I've done videos on my top five fightiest armies and my top five surviviest armies or units certainly. In the game but uh I don't, yeah have i done one under top five armies i can't remember but uh, this is what i think are the top five armies of the napoleonic period and i'm going to go into a little bit of explanation why but uh, it's not to be taken too, too, too seriously this one is just for a little bit of fun and let's enjoy it and down in fifth place we have the french army of 1809 this is the french army that took part in the danube campaign and they fought the, the uh, austrians for this one now the reason that they are down in fifth is that they are the the nub the remnants of the grand army uh, but they have still got a lot of their top level commanders they've still got a lot of veterans from the earlier wars napoleon is still moderately at the peak of his powers and his marshals are still kind of under his control as well you've got the likes of marshal lan and your boy general la salle so you've still got some real top-notch level french commanders going on here the army know what they're doing now they're up against an austrian army which also knows what it's doing it's had quite a few reforms one thing that they do not match the french in is light infantry though and the Battle of Ekmal really showed that the French Light Infantry Doctrine was still at the peak of fighting at the time. They were still the masters of this kind of individual warfare. And I think in combination with the massed cavalry charges that were brilliantly coordinated by people like General de Spagna, again, he would fall as victim of a casualty in 1809 as well. He'd be killed at the Battle of Wagram. Actually, no, I think he was killed at Aspen Essling. But um, he was a great heavy cavalry commander. So a good army, but not quite high enough, or not quite good enough to make it higher up this list. Speaking of which, in fourth place, we have the Russian army of 1812. Now, the Russians are an interesting one. And the reason why I've given them this year in particular is because this is the year that they were fighting on their home soil. And that's something that makes their army much more deadly than it would be later. Although, you know, it was no slouch in 18, 13, and 14 and the chase across Europe. Don't get me wrong. But in 1812, I think they were at their absolute peak in powers. And that was due to the mass uprising of the Opolcheni as well. They had loads of militia units. Not that they were very good, but they provided huge amounts of manpower, huge amounts of muskets occasionally <laughs> that they could turn against the French. Their commanders were quite battle-hardened, having fought across Europe in 1805, 1807, 1808. They'd also fought campaigns against the Ottomans down in the Crimea, which is where Kutuzov lost his eye. And they'd also completed the successful invasion of Lithuania only two years earlier as well. So the Russians were full of commanders who knew their jobs. Now, one of the problems in 1812 was... Uh, well, as I said, they had this mass uprising. Everyone got involved, including a lot of people who were, shall we say, less competent in their roles. But scattered amongst them were the men who absolutely knew what they were doing. Kutuzov being chief amongst them. So the army had the battle record. It had some very good commanders. It had excellent heavy artillery. And the thing that provides the X factor that takes it to number four in my list is it also had the religious fervor and the patriotic fervor it's, even today it's still called the first great patriotic war and that's what makes for me the russian army of 1812 the fourth best in the napoleonic wars so now we are up to the top three and in bronze medal position i'm gonna have the british army of 1813 now why am i saying 1813 in particular to be honest it was a bit of a toss of the coin. I could have gone for 1815 and the 100 Days Campaign British Army because they had the increased cavalry there. You had the Household Division and the Heavy Cavalry Brigade as well were there. So that's the reason why I thought maybe the Waterloo Army. But 
It wasn't just the British Army at Waterloo. They also had lots of Dutch Belgians involved. And I felt that that, that lessened the, uh, the power of the army, shall we say. By the time you get to 1813, the Peninsula War has been going on for well, arguably four years now. Five years, you could, you could also argue. So for five years, the British Army there, they were hardened veterans. They also had allies. They didn't fight on their own in Spain either. Their allies were mainly made up of the Portuguese and the Spanish. Those two parts of the army were also very battle-hardened. Now, the Spanish were a separate army, so we're not going to talk about them. But the Portuguese, they were integrated to the British army. A division would often have two brigades of British and a brigade of Portuguese. So they count as part of the British army in this. Also very well-trained, battle-hardened, very good troops. Additionally, I also said that we had some allies in the Waterloo campaign and in the Peninsula. We also had the King's German Legion battalions who had influxes of recruits after the uh, German countries were liberated in 1812, 1813, and they came across to uh, the peninsula as well. Not quite so much as would come later, but enough to season, leaven the bread, season the pudding of the British army in Spain. The Duke of Wellington, absolutely at the peak of his powers, I think, at Vittoria. Again, as with Napoleon in 1809, he's got those great subordinate commanders as well. You've got your General Hills, you've got your General Pictons. You've got a good army that know their trade, and I think that's going to be the key. The rifles have been fully integrated into the army by this point. Again, we've got the excellent skirmish campaigns going on. Now, it did help, to be fair, that the French were completely defeated morally, m morally, if that's a word, by this point anyway. But uh, still, now the British army in 1813 are my pick for the third best army, the third most powerful army of the Napoleonic Wars. So now we go into the top two. It's a bit of a drum roll, this one. Bit of a coin toss. But in second place, and I think this is going to be very controversial, I'm going to put the French army of 1805. Now, if you've spent any time on this channel, you have heard me wax lyrical about the Grand Armée of 1805 on more than one occasion, I'm sure. And this doesn't change any of that. I think the army that had been prepared, the army of Angleterre, the army of England, that had been encamped along the shores of Normandy in 1804, had done a lot of training. And I mean a lot of training. They'd had company exercises, battalion, regimental, corps, uh, sorry, um, brigade, division, and even corps level exercises. Regular inspections from not only Napoleon's marshals, but also from the emperor himself, and a cadre of officers that had got to their positions almost entirely on merit. The The key men who took part in the Napoleonic Wars are all here, and they're all present. These are young, vital men. You've got people like General Murat, or Marshal Murat. Now, I'm someone who will mock him quite, quite heavily, but in 1805, he's still the man that he, he could have been later. Marshal Ney, I've often said, he I, I believe that he really suffered in the Russian campaign. Obviously, that's still quite a long way in the future. In addition to the superb cavalry commanders, people like Kellerman and LaSalle, we mentioned earlier on, um, Despania, you've got those great infantry commanders as well. Let's not remember that it was... Uh, Marshal Lan, I think, who uh, once grabbed a ladder and said, remember I was once a grenadier. You've still got these phenomenal characters that really make up the Napoleonic Wars, and they're still there. They're at the height of their power. These are young men, and they are yet to let personal ambition and personal disillusionment get in the way of them being the best soldiers that they can be. The French Army of 1805, I think, is one of the most passionate armies that has ever existed by passion i don't necessarily mean that they are the they don't treat war as a science they treat it as an art form and i think that's where the true genius of napoleon comes in and at this time you still got the men who believe in that vision the troops are they're very well trained they're not particularly battle hardened at this point but they've had all that training at bologna they fight the battle of austerlitz the the leaving the Pratsen Heights and recapturing it, not only is that a tactical masterstroke from Napoleon, but also 
they had to be recaptured. There's a lot of hard fighting going on there. And that's where you've got the skill of colonels, majors, captains, right down to sergeants and even individual soldiers. Really, they're all part of this grand project, this, this grand revolutionary ideal, this new empire that's just been founded. I think the army of, uh, we spoke earlier on about the Russian army having the religious fervor. I think there's part of that in the 1805 French army as well. For my money, they're the, uh, well, I, I've said it before, they're the most well-trained, well-led army in Europe, possibly since the Roman legions. But that's still not enough to get them to number one in my list. Number one in my list of the most powerful, the best armies of the Napoleonic Wars, goes to the 1815 Prussian army. Now, I said just now that the 1805 French were an army who treated war as an art. Well, here we've got an army that treats it as a science. And coming into 19th century warfare, which would then directly lead into 20th century warfare, we can see that warfare has become a science. The uh, for, for more information on the Prussian army, then watch my five-part series on the Prussians. But I'm going to go into the highlights here. First off, the Krumper system just allowed Prussia to raise a huge number of troops in relation to its population that were well-trained. We've got the motivation. The, the Prussian hatred for France is something that would burn for another century. Despite them being quite successful towards the end of the 19th century, it still wasn't quite enough. The humiliations that they suffered in 1806, even when they occupied Paris, they were still thinking of trying to destroy the Yenna Bridge and things like this. And we've said a few times about how important the commanders and their subcommanders being at the top of their game was. Now, Blücher actually probably wasn't at the top of his game at this point, but his staff team were possibly the greatest staff that have ever existed. You could maybe argue for the Imperial German staff in the First World War, but I don't think... I don't think even they can beat this staff. You've got people like von Clausewitz and von Gneis now. These guys are implementing the scientific warfare changes that they saw. And some respect here has to go to Frederick Wilhelm as well for allowing this to happen. But the idea of having each regiment made up of two musketeer battalions and a fusilier battalion, the idea of having a battalion of Landwehr attached to each parent battalion these all form the basis of modern military formations today so many i mean maybe not today today but certainly during the cold war many regular infantry regiments would have a territorial army unit attached to them this allowed the regular units to swap in and out personnel and it allowed the territorial army to have those close ties with their parental regiment and also get those excellent sergeants and senior ncos to do the training that would get them to the level of the regulars far quicker than if they had their own NCOs and officers. They were also the first to, well, not the first, the French were the first, but the Prussians were the first of the Allies to see the power of the Lancer. Let's not remember that in the 19th century, we fought a lot of colonial wars, not just us, but everyone did, and the Lancers were some of the key troops there. Most nations went into the First World War with regiments of Lancers, so that just goes to show how much their influence spread over the uh, the 19th century, and that was in no small part to the Prussians adopting them. It was once said that Prussia was an army with a nation attached to it, and I think this also foreshadows what was to come in future warfare. The Prussians were already gearing up for total war long before anyone even considered it would be a, a necessary or even a possibility condition to be in. And by 1815, they'd put all these together. You had the near-religious fervor. On, oh, I'm thinking now about the attacks in Linny. I think that the casualties that the Prussians suffered were absolutely humongous, but it still didn't stop them. They had good to moderate to good artillery, not as good as the French or the Russians, but still pretty good. A cavalry arm, what they had of it was excellent. They were focused very much on close relations close cooperation with the infantry which again they they almost invented combined arms warfare there's a there's a lot to be said for the prussians of 1815 and the more that you look into them the more interesting i think they become so that's it as i say it was a bit of a fun video i just wanted to do something a little bit a little bit different we've had a couple of uh, high content ones in the last couple of weeks 
I thought I'd do one that was a bit more of a discussion piece. And I hope you guys can pop down in the comments below your top five armies of the Napoleonic period. And tell me now I'm an idiot. That's absolutely fine. It's all in good fun. But, 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 this is my only, uh, my only caveat. If you're going to put down your list of your top two or your top one or your top three, top five, whatever... Explain why you're putting them in there, because I'd really I, I might do a follow-up video where I read some other top fives out, and we see who's got the uh, the most consensus, who's the who's who the community think the uh, the real best army in the Napoleonic warfare is. My vote's going to be for eighteen fifteen Prussians, but I'm genuinely interested to find out what you guys think the number one is, and let me know in the comments down below. But thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.